six o'clock, 1800. So let's get going. Um, we'll go to call the meeting to order per ORS 192.610 to 192.690 and ORS 192.650. This meeting is being recorded. Um, so this is the monthly meeting. We're on um, teleconference and the recording of this meeting will be placed on the Clackamas Fire website. Chief Charlton, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. President, thank you. Um, okay, so did everybody get a chance to look at the uh, minutes, both from these, uh, the regular board meeting that we had and the special board meeting that we had um, also on uh, December 1st? Is there any comments anybody wants to make about any of those uh, um, those minutes or anything? Okay, so um, nobody had any comments or no changes, and then we'll accept the meeting. We'll accept the minutes by consensus. I only stand approved as written. Okay, we're down to public comment. Um, this always can be just a little clunky on uh, video conferencing, but. This is an opportunity for public comment uh, for those that have signed in. So we'll give those folks just a couple of minutes to figure out their machine if they want to chime in. Okay. Doesn't look like anybody's going to want public comment. So we will move down to uh, looks like Heather, you have a presentation for us. I do. So good evening, President Cross, members of the board. Um, I'm here tonight to give you information and training that is required under OSHA's temporary standard, uh, which took effect on November 16th, 2020. And I do have a PowerPoint, so I'm hoping that will pop up in a second. Perfect. Um, and all of the chiefs on this meeting, I think this is the fourth time that they've gotten this presentation. So um, if you have any questions after, I'm sure they could give it themselves. And even Jeff Griffin, this is his second time sitting through it. So uh, Rachel, if you would go to the next slide, please. Okay, so why do you need the training as board members? Um, you can see OSHA's definition of an employee, which includes elected officials. And the training needs to be completed by December 21st. So we just made it uh, by the date we had to have it done for OSHA. Um, and it's supposed to be completed live to give an opportunity for feedback. So there'll be an opportunity after I'm done with the presentation for any of the questions that you have. Um, this is the basic training that is required, which our administrative staff got last month. There is additional training for workplaces at, at exceptional risk, and that does include fire departments, but we don't have to include administrative staff or board members in the additional training because your job functions for Clackamas Fire aren't included in the exceptional risk definition. Um, there's 10 training topics, which I know sounds like a lot, but I will get through them very quickly. Um, and I have a slide or two on each. The first six topics relate specifically to how Clackamas Fire is dealing with COVID and how we operate. And the final four cover basic education on COVID. So next slide, please. In this era of COVID-19, I think we're all more aware of our own personal bubble, uh, meaning how close we get to people around us than we have been in the past. OSHA does require that we ensure both work activities and workflow are designed to eliminate the need for any employee or board member to be within six feet of another individual when they're doing their job, unless we can demonstrate it's not feasible to do so. This is because COVID-19 can spread among people near each other. So by staying at least six feet away, we're hopefully minimizing the spread. As board members, we've been able to offer Zoom meetings in order to not be in the same room. If we did bring you back in for meetings, we would have to come up with a different way of running meetings because sitting at the boardroom table would not offer you the six feet of space. Next slide, please. Um, as you know, Oregon Health Authority and OSHA have changed the requirements on face coverings many times, and so has the district. So currently we're requiring face coverings at all times in shared areas, which would include the community room at station five where you hold your meetings. Firefighters do have a carve out regarding face coverings at the fire station in the OSHA standard, which goes further to define living space versus common space. But basically, if anyone comes into their living space, which includes a different shift, a battalion chief, any staff, contractor, pretty much anyone, then everybody would be in face coverings. The picture shows you what face coverings you should choose. Covers, co excuse me, coverings that incorporate a valve 
Mesh masks or other coverings with holes, visible gaps, or vents are not appropriate face coverings because they allow droplets to be released from the covering. Next slide, please. And I keep saying face coverings, but we hear masks said too. So what's the difference? OSHA defines face coverings as cloth, polypropylene, paper, or other covering that covers the nose and mouth and rests snugly above the nose, below the mouth, and on the sides of the face. OSHA defines masks as medical grade masks that function to protect workers from splashes of blood or body fluids. They do not provide reliable protection to the wearer against aerosols or airborne pathogens like COVID-19. OSHA requires that Clackamas Fire, as the employer, provide face coverings or masks to all employees as an option, but you're always welcome to wear your own as long as it meets the requirements that I talked about on the previous slide. And you all should have gotten masks from Clackamas Fire as an option to wear. If you haven't, you will get it soon. And before you put on a mask or face covering or take it off, you should wash your hands and make sure you don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth when taking off the mask. Next slide, please. OSHA requires us to clean and disinfect any common areas, high touch surfaces, and any shared equipment regularly. This includes counters, doorknobs, light switches, et cetera. Our crew have to clean and disinfect three times per shift per the OSHA standard. Our offices have to be cleaned at least once a day per the standard. In locations that are drop-in like the community rooms, we just need to clean and disinfect before use. And so Clackamas Fire staff would ensure that these rooms would be cleaned um, if you did come back in for board meetings. And the EPA does have a website that's dedicated to COVID-19 um, and what's appropriate to clean and disinfect with. Uh, that currently has four approved disinfectants and we label them to show that they do kill COVID-19 and how long the contact time should be. Contact time means how long it needs to stay wet on a surface. Because if you spray a disinfectant and immediately wipe it off, you are not killing the germs. Reusable masks and face coverings should be washed as well, which is the second part of this slide. Uh, the CDC recommends washing after every use. Uh, the outside can be contaminated with bacteria and viruses in the environment, and they can actually cause an infection if they're worn for a prolonged period of time without being cleaned. Next slide, please. Hygiene. So I think we're much more cognizant of hand washing than we ever have been. Um, hopefully this far into the pandemic, everyone's still being diligent with hand washing. Um, like we've all heard, if you sing happy birthday twice while you're washing and you scrub everywhere, you're washing properly. Um, and then I put a picture of chopping up jalapenos on the slide because I've heard if you wash your hands as if you just cut up jalapenos and then you went to put in your contacts right after, uh, you would wash your hands very thoroughly between doing those two activities. And hand washing is such an effective means because the coronavirus is actually encased in a layer of fat. So soap breaks that fat apart and leaves it unable to infect you as long as you wash for long enough. Hand sanitizers are not as effective but can be used when you can't wash your hands. You just wanna make sure you use enough of it and that you let it dry. Because I talked about contact time with the disinfectants, it's the same with hand sanitizers. If you put it on your hands and then you wipe it off, um, you aren't killing the germs. You're just rubbing the hand, the hand sanitizer off. And then remember to use hand sanitizers that have at least 60% alcohol to kill the germs. Next slide, please. If you come into a district facility, you must sign in at the temperature check station and take your temperature. In addition, we would need to ensure you don't have any COVID symptoms. So we've added a list of symptoms to the top of the temperature screening form for you to look at while you're taking your temperature to ensure you're healthy to be on district premises. If you came for a board meeting, we would set a temperature screening little um, post uh, where you walk in to the front of station five. We wouldn't have you come through the bay. We also ask that if you're sick or have COVID type symptoms, which we will go over in a few slides, that you stay away from Clackamas Fire and the CDC also recommends you stay home in general. We ask our employees and volunteers to think about their health and to self-monitor themselves daily. They don't have to turn anything in. If they have potential symptoms of COVID-19, we do have a district symptom logger that only wellness personnel have access to. We ask you as board members to let us know if you have COVID-19 symptoms or are diagnosed with COVID only if you were on premises at any point during the infectious period, which is 48 hours prior to symptoms, or if you don't have symptoms, 48 hours prior to your positive COVID test. Otherwise, you're a private citizen and don't need to disclose that to us. Next slide, please. If for some reason you started to have symptoms during a board meeting or a work session and were on site, we would ask that you immediately remove yourself from the meeting, notify the fire chief, and follow up with your healthcare provider. The reason we ask that you notify is then uh, Clackamas Fire would clean and disinfect the area immediately. Next slide. 
If a member of Clackamas Fire tests positive for COVID-19, OSHA does require that they notify the workplace. You are supposed to notify your supervisor, um, but I was thinking about the board members and your supervisor are the public. So that could get a little awkward. So if you've been in any district facilities, you can either notify the fire chief or you're welcome to notify me if you'd rather keep it in wellness. Um, when we look at who you might've been con in contact with, we will not use your name unless you've given us specific permission. In the four cases that we've had at Clackamas Fire, we have gotten permission from each individual to use their names when we contact Trace. And it has made it way easier for others to know if their contact was high risk or low risk. But that is up to you and we would protect your privacy. So next slide. OSHA requires that we have a process to notify exposed employees. Exposed employees include those who were within six feet of a confirmed COVID-19 individual for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more, regardless of whether one or both of them were wearing face coverings or masks. Through the notification process, we let anyone who was present in the facility know that they potentially had a work-related contact with an individual who tested positive for COVID-19. We use our staffing program, which is Telestaff, the activities calendar, our temperature check forms, and notified potential departments who could have come by the facility during the time frame to figure out who was potentially exposed. For CDC, we do go back 48 hours from when symptoms first started, or if the COVID positive individual is asymptomatic, 48 hours from the positive COVID test to notify. When we make notification, we determine whether their exposure meets the criteria for high-risk exposure. And if they do, we will send them home to quarantine for CDC guidance. Notification must be done within 24 hours of when the district is notified of the COVID positive employee, but we try to do it as soon as possible after we gather all the pertinent information. Next slide, please. Wherever Clackamas Fire, through our internal contact tracing or through contact tracing done by Oregon Health Authority through public health, recommends that an employee be restricted from work due to quarantine because of a high-risk exposure or isolation from having COVID-19, the affected worker must not come to work, and the recommendation is to isolate at home and away from other non-quarantined individuals. OSHA does require everything on these bullet points, but again, as board members, we can meet these very easily. Next slide, please. We're now on to the basic COVID-19 training, starting with how the virus is transmitted. The most common way to get COVID-19 is close contact, which is why the government has been restricting the number of people in places and asking us to stay at least six feet apart from one another. When someone coughs, sneeze, sneezes, excuse me, talks, they produce droplets in the air that can be inhaled by another person or can be deposited on another person's mucous membranes, such as those that line the inside of the nose and the mouth. Less common is the spread through airborne transmission. For example, when people are in an enclosed space like fitness classes, choir practice, or in restaurants, there is growing evidence that droplets can remain suspended in the air beyond six feet indoors. So that's why indoor environments without good ventilation increase this risk. The last part of transmission could be droplets on surfaces that may spread the virus. That's what the CDC says, may, not does. And that would be by touching a surface or object that has the virus and then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes. That's why washing your hands and disinfecting surfaces is so important. Next slide, please. COVID-19 affects people in different ways. Infected people have a wide range of symptoms reported from no symptoms to mild to severe illness. If someone has symptoms, they may appear, appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. If you have a fever, cough, or other symptoms listed on this slide, you might have COVID-19, but you might have a cold or flu as well. That's why it's important to follow up with your healthcare provider if you're feeling sick. Call them and they can offer you a virtual visit in most cases. Most of the time they don't want you coming to their clinic if you're sick. Most people infected with COVID-19 will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment. Older people and those with underlying medical conditions are more likely to develop <clears throat> serious illness. People of all ages who experience difficulty breathing, chest pain or pressure, new confusion, an inability to awaken, or have bluish lips or face are encouraged to seek emergency care. Next slide, please. OSHA wants to make sure that you know you can get COVID-19 from people without symptoms. The difference between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic are that asymptomatic people are infected but never develop symptoms, while pre-symptomatic people are also infected have not developed symptoms currently, but go on to develop them later. Mm -hmm. The term viral shedding is used in reference to the infectiousness of COVID-19. 
This means that both pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals who may not yet be experiencing any of the viral symptoms are still shedding the virus while they talk, exhale, eat, and perform other normal daily activities. This is another reason that physical distancing and face coverings are important. Next slide, please. The last topic that OSHA asked that I go over with you is in regards to how we have made the workplace safer to minimize employee and volunteer exposure to COVID-19. Um, we have developed a COVID-19 infection control plan that was part of the OSHA temporary standard and Clackamas Fire listed 34 workplace practices and control measures that we've added or updated due to COVID-19. And some of those include changes to our EMS protocols, how we transport, how we often we disinfect, and encouraging telecommuting for non-essential employees to name just a few. And I'm gonna go over a few that would impact you as a board member and most have already been talked about in the presentation, but OSHA asks that I do it again. So first we provide face coverings to all personnel and education on when face coverings are required. We minimize contact among workers by replacing face-to-face -face meetings with virtual meetings. If we have board meetings or work sessions in person, we ensure six feet of distancing between each person. We ask employees with symptoms of COVID-19 or who have a sick family member at home with COVID-19 to stay home. We ask anyone that enters our facilities to come in one entrance to each building, conduct a personal health check and temperature screening prior to their workday. We ensure cleaning and disinfecting of high touch surfaces, common areas and office spaces. EPA registered disinfectants are provided to all work sites. We provide workers with up-to-date education and training on COVID-19 risk factors and protective behaviors and you're getting a portion of what we've been doing since March today. And we promote personal hygiene with a no touch hand soap, no touch hand sanitizer, and no touch paper towel holders. This was done prior to COVID-19, but it is a protective measure that we have in place. So congratulations, you've made it through our OSHA mandated COVID-19 training. I do appreciate your time and welcome any questions you have about the presentation, how Clackamas Fire is handling COVID-19 or any other questions you might have. Uh, but before I open it up, I want to note that we do have a vaccination team in place working on how we will distribute vaccines to our members, but I don't have any details to share at this time, and I thought that might be a question tonight. So again, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Have you seen the um, Oregon Health Authority's uh, new document that came out on uh, December 4th for um, the changes that they made? There's, yes. a couple of, there's a couple of changes in there, like cloth masks and... Um, yes. yes, and, and we masks. updated our infection control plan to make sure that it, it met the changes in there, yep. Yeah, and, then, and, did you, and then there was the new uh, interim investigation guidelines that came out on December 9th. Did you see that one? Yes, so that's for looking at the permanent standard. So right now we're in the temporary standard and those are, they're pushing those out for comment um, is how I believe it is. And it's for the permanent rule that comes out, um, I believe in May. So um, yes, uh, Chief Stewart, Chief Brent Olson, who's our safety chief, and I have been keeping up to date on all of that. Um, Jason Jancy from SDAO, there's a work group. And so he sends us all of the documentation and it feels like there's something new every day. It's yeah. a lot well, to keep up with, I will say. Well, the, the thing that jumped out at me the biggest on the one that came out on December 4th is cloth face masks is not in there. So you might want to take a hard look at that. Um, so it kind of it kind of throws a monkey wrench into stuff. So, but you know, we take a look at it. Okay, we will look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. That was wonderful. So, All right. Thanks for your time. I know it's not exciting stuff, but we got through um, it together. Well, you know, it's it's the thing of the day, and it's it's important to stay as current as possible, even though tomorrow it may be different. But um, anybody else have any questions for Heather on this? I do, Jay. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. I just want to commend you, Heather, because I actually had to read the temporary uh, OSHA order myself because of uh, certain uh, client advice that I had to give. And it is horrible. And I think it, you are to be highly commended. As you noted, things change also every single day, practically every minute, um, on what's good and what's not good and where we go and what we're doing. So you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. I appreciate that. And there is a team of us doing it. But yes, it, it's a lot. And they don't necessarily notify you that things have changed. <laughs> yeah, so every true. day I go to the OSHA site and get the newest version of the temporary standard. Because since they posted it 
for November 16th, there's been at least five different updates. And so it's, it's a lot to keep up with in yeah. addition to all the CDC information, the Oregon Health Authority information. So um, yeah, I mean, security. <laughs> yeah, not only do you have OROSHA, but you're so right. You have the OHA and, uh, and those are just the state agencies plus then you have a federal overlay. And so, I mean, it's just a nightmare. Oh, volume of information. Well, I, I, I appreciate wanna, that. I want to echo that. Good job. I know that for me personally, I've been dealing, that's all I've been doing for the last two weeks since I started rolling out the Pfizer vaccine. And I've just been inundated. I, I have, you probably saw me thumbing through it, but I literally have a stack of paperwork that's got to be at least five inches thick that I've read just since last Monday because of the changes and stuff that come, that's coming out with the inoculations. And, and you have a team. I don't have a team. I got me. And so, <laughs> so I... Uh, well, reach out anytime. We're happy to, to well, team work with you. Yeah, actually, I've been working with Karen Barr from the Port of Portland. But yeah, no, uh, keep up the good work. That's It's important stuff to... Uh, it's really important stuff, and as you just said, the, it's such a moving target that it can be um, it, what what you read today isn't accurate tomorrow. So, anyway. all right. Anybody else got anything? All right, let's uh, let's move Thomas, on down here. Hey, Thomas had his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, I, I placed my my hands up on the uh, participant, but it, you didn't see that. But anyway, my question is Heather how do they classify the elected officials as an employees? What's the justification for that? That's a great question, Thomas, because the first few versions that came out of the temporary standard did not have a definition of employee. And when I was updating the infection control plan, because I keep looking at the newest changes, um, that's why you're getting it on December 21st, because we didn't know on November 16th that um, board members and elected officials, but you saw in that first slide, it had the definition. And so we thought, well, you know, I, I don't anticipate a lot of places are doing this, but we want to make sure that um, we're trying to do everything we can to make sure because when you come into our workplace, I mean, you are, you are part of us, you're part of our personnel. And, and so OSHA wants to make sure that you know how how we're cleaning, how we're wearing face coverings, how we're socially distanced, excuse me, physically distancing. How, how do they define the employees? We don't come into the facility and work with you. The only time we have activity with you is when we have a meeting, committee meetings or board meetings. How can they, why, why would that be a, uh, an employee relations? That is a great question that I think is better directed at OSHA because I don't know. Like I said, it was part of their um, definition of employee that was on that first slide. Um, and it was a, a surprise to me. that um, That's the directive that. you got, right? Hey, Thomas, today, yeah. as of today, when they had a meeting earlier today, they still yeah. don't, they still can't, they still can't decide what a first responder is. Yeah. <laughs> They're still struggling with that. So when they say they're going to give inoculations to the first responders, they say, who is this? And the OHA still doesn't have a definition for that. So that's, and we're on the brink of having, rolling out the vaccinations. So yeah. It's, Thank you, Heather. It's been so oh, I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer. Jeff, do you have an answer? No, no, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yep. <laughs> hey, uh, Heather, I concur. Great job on that presentation. Thank you. Uh, on that, definition list of employee I didn't see volunteers on there it's just I, it said elected officials and career and all that but uh, I, I thought that for all intents and purposes and it mentioned workman's comp well we have workman's comp on our volunteers but it yet it didn't say volunteers I agree and we have been including our volunteers in everything treating them just they get the exact same training so our suppression we actually put our suppression and support together because it was easier for staff to give the presentations at nighttime but they all got the extra training which was the uh, exceptional risk workplace training so they got more um with that but you're right they weren't included in on the definition okay thanks but okay. i kind of wonder also you know sometimes we have volunteers that come in and do filing or do different things and so i think different agencies have different definitions of volunteers. And so maybe that's why they didn't include it, but I'm not sure. Heather, you always do such a great job. Uh, Thomas, I believe how OSHA is trying to loop it in is as Jim had mentioned with volunteers, there's a, what's called the contractor test. And normally workers' comp is triggered by payroll 
but how volunteers and how board members frequently get looped into workers' compensation is do they work uh, at our control? Do they work at our time frame with our equipment? Because we have a board meeting that is set because we work with our equipment, I think that's how they're trying to loop it in. It, this has been a debate for many, many years as a volunteer, uh, should they be covered under workers' comp or not? Technically the law would say no, but always if there's an injury, we are deemed to be responsible, which is why we ensure the volunteers for an assumed wage and workers' compensation. So I think that's how they're trying to loop us in is with the, what's called the contractor test. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure, thanks. Okay, anything else for Heather? All right, good job, Heather. Good answers and good and timely and very informative. All right, we have, where am I at? Um, presentation from Jeff Griffin, you are up. Mr. President and board uh, and employees and guests uh, tonight, uh, I'm gonna take just a moment to drill down a little deeper than we do uh, because of changes in our industry. And I wanna make sure that we get all questions addressed. If we leave this Zoom meeting and I've missed something, please feel free to shoot me an email or go through the chief and, and uh, uh, let me know and I'll get back to you and make sure we get everything answered. In February, we wrote our annual budget letter. We've been doing this for the better part of 30 years. Usually that budget letter says expect a four to a 5% change. Most of that is usually based on change in values. SDO's rates have been extremely stable. This year uh, in February, we had recommended you plan on about a 12% change. Now, fortunately we're under that significantly, but our reason for that was uh, twofold. Uh, we have seen some significant losses that are a little bit unique. Uh, on the property side, you're well aware of uh, the wildland fires that occurred this last year in Oregon. But nationwide, FEMA, who keep in mind pays after the insurance companies pay, um, in the last decade, FEMA has paid out $802 billion in losses. In the last five years, they have had 59 losses that were a billion plus. 2017 was the worst of years. Um, in just three hurricanes, it was over $300 billion. That was, Herma, that was uh, Irma, Maria, and uh, Harvey. Um, what we're seeing is a trend. Uh, uh, OSHA, excuse me, FEMA says that uh, uh, three of their worst years in history have been the last five years, uh, and that is driving the property rate up. We do think that it will stabilize this next year. We have seen some insurers show some major profitability this year. The reinsurance rates still, uh, still are high. We've also seen some tracking, uh, some increased rates as we track claims in cyber uh, and in and EPL, employment liability. So there's been some changes there. SDO does have a rate lock uh, of 5%, and you came in significantly under that. If on your I sent you a, a, a proposal, and if you turn to page 14, there is a comparison report, and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes there walking you through what that says and tell you where, where your rates fell. Most of your rate change is in change of values. If you go halfway across the page uh, to percent of change, it's the fourth column over, your first column liability changed a fair amount, but that was because of the LB1. The LB1 went up uh, significantly. It was reported to SDAO this year, and that's why that rate changed. Your other rate changes are extremely modest, uh, including a property rate that went down 1%. That's a credit to your maintenance and your claims history and property. Most all property went up at least 5%, the maximum that SDAO would allow. If you go over to the next column, you'll see why your rates have changed. In our uh, physical damage for automobiles, we added about 2.4 million in values. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit, but that created about a $7,000 increase in your premium. And then our property changes, we added about a million dollars there, uh, and that 
that added a couple of thousand dollars in premium to changes. So overall, uh, your net change this year from last year is 8.24, which is about 4% below what we had projected. Most all of that is in value changes. I want to talk about at first, and I should have started here. I worked Christina and uh, Bill Bischoff to death this year, going down on uh, uh, going drilling down on each building and each piece of apparatus for its values and then our deductibles. And I want to go through a little bit of what they experienced working with me. I'm a little bit A type, and I I think they both probably ate an awful lot of aspirin uh, when I left. I think Bill and I spoke five or six times on vehicles. Let me give you a feel for what's going on. If you turn to your vehicle schedule, which is a page five and six, you're looking at pretty close to uh, 140 vehicles. The liability for those vehicles is, is quite cheap. It's about $17,000. It's about 125 bucks a rig annually. Your personal vehicles are much, much higher than that. That's a credit to how you operate and the fact that you have very few liability claims. Our physical damage is about $53,000 in total premium. Uh, we have had uh, some collisions and fender benders. Um, but even with that, when you look at the total value of all of our apparatus, that's not uh, out of line with, with what we're insuring. What happened this year when we started doing the analytics? Because in 1901, uh, the, the uh, NFPA standards on how we build apparatus, they've gone through the roof. Two years ago, we were insuring a ladder truck uh, for about $900,000. Today, that same ladder truck costs about a million four. Your ladder trucks are based, the cost is based on the length of the ladder, uh, whether there's a bucket or not, whether there's a tiller, there's a number of ingredients, but your ladder companies to replace one today is up to about a million four. Our engine companies, and if you've been around the department uh, many years, it wasn't that long ago, you were buying first class apparatus for two, $300,000. Uh, today, those same engine companies rolling off the line run about $650,000. If you look at the auto schedule, uh, about two thirds of the page over, you'll see what's called APD. That's the physical damage. Anything that's replacement, if we lose it, the insurance company will give us new or old up to the stated limit. So it's critical we have that stated limit reasonable for a true replacement cost. But note that there's a second uh, term there called functional. And that means the apparatus is old enough, they will not replace it, but they will get us one that meets the NFPA standard. So for example, the very first vehicle scheduled is a 2001 uh, American La France. The functional value on that is about $100,000. And this is where Bill and I went back and forth looking at different organizations that sell used apparatus. Uh, Brindley Mountain is one of them that we watch pretty closely. Uh, and those numbers, we can get a reasonable uh, high quality rig. In that case, for $100,000, we're going to end up with probably a 2002, 2005 Pierce. We can't get replacement because of the age. So we don't want to insure more than what it's going to cost, more than we're going to get on a claim. So what we did was uh, together we went through each piece of apparatus. The ones that are on functional, we dropped down to what it would cost to get a, a similar one. The ones that are still under replacement, we raised uh, to get us as close to what it would cost to get new for old. That's how we ended up with uh, about two and a half million dollars in value change there. If you look at our property, uh, you know that the uh, construction costs in the Northwest Oregon and Washington are through the roof. Uh, it wasn't too many years ago that I was telling you a stick frame station was going up for about 200 bucks. Today, that's 350. You built one last year, if it is a concrete, brick, brick uh, uh, tilt up concrete, those are running frequently um, between 350 and 500 bucks a foot. We just finished one up in the Seattle area. It was 647 a foot to build. Now, keep in mind on your property, we have a true blanket. So if you had a loss on one of you, any one of your locations, SDA will pay up to 64, 63,786,000 thousand dollars on a specific loss but the contract requires that we try to insure to its true value so we watch that very very closely we added about a million dollars in value to our buildings now the question is how do we cut the cost 
So we worked with staff on what we call the point of diminishing return graph for deductibles. And I'm just gonna throw a couple of numbers at you to get you to see where, where we're at and why we're at a $5,000 deductible. On property, uh, the base rate starts at 250. There's no credit. If you have a lower deductible, they charge you more. If you raise the deductible, they give you credit. So if you go from 250 to 500, you save 5%. If you go to 1,000, you save 10%. 2,500 is 15%. 5,000 is the magic spot. It's a 25% savings. Now, here's the crazy thing. Immediately, you want to go to 10,000 to save 50%. You don't. The, the deductible credit only goes up 4%. So when we do the graph, the sweet spot right now for property is $5,000. We do that graph each year. Uh, but right now, $5,000 saves us the maximum amount of money, reduces the premium down, and still keeps our buildings uh, at the proper value. We do the same with vehicles. Now, this one was much tougher. Uh, in the case of vehicles on collision, there's no credit for a $500 deductible. If you have a lower one, they charge you more. 1,000 gets 10%, 2,500 gets 15%, 5,000 gets 25%, 10,000 only gets a 30% deductible credit. So when we do the sweet spot, what we found with the frequency of claims that we have had, we are the last two years at an exact break even. The year before we were lost about $20,000. We wanna let it uh, season. Uh, another year or two to see where our collisions go. But right now you're spot on for where you should be at a $1,000 deductible for comp and collision on our vehicles. That's how we got to the rate structure that we're at. Your changes are mostly in values, not in uh, rate. The rates were, were uh, modestly changed, but because our LB1 went up, our uh, uh, budget for personal services our budget for material and services both went up significantly, um, about two and a half million dollars, and then values on our buildings and our equipment. Now, the question you haven't asked that we need to ask always is, is it time to self-insure? Uh, we look at that. It is not yet. We do watch that, but we're running about a 32% uh, loss ratio over a short period of time uh, with the risk factor, with the filing key fees, and buying reinsurance, it does not make sense yet. It may make sense downstream, uh, but right now it does not. Another question to always ask is who are the competitors? Uh, now nationally, uh, and we do work in 48 states, uh, nationally uh, there are some for-profit companies. There's a name called VFIS. You were insured with them once for a couple of years, a group called ESIP. They're big on the East Coast. Uh, VFIS has quite a bit of business in Washington. They do not give us pre-loss legal, but they are not uh, as competitive as TAO in either rates or in coverage in Oregon. There are other for-profits uh, that offer a public entity package, Liberty, Hartford, uh, Zurich are, are three of them. Uh, there are a number that do that AIG, and uh, none of them compare coverage-wise or rate-wise to where special districts is at this time. There are two other pools in Oregon. There's a school pool and there's a city pool. We don't qualify for either. So right now you're in the right spot, but we always need to continue to watch uh, and do a market analysis to see if that changes. I went through an awful lot of material in a, in a short order. Before I get into short and long-term strategies, do you have questions on how we've set up the coverage to date? I have a question. Go ahead, um, I, uh, Jeff, on the uh, sublimits on the property coverage, um, there's a hundred thousand dollar sublimit on um, on a leasehold interest, and uh, we have the Oregon City Station, which is a leasehold interest, and it's valued on the schedules at one hundred eighty-two thousand, which is interesting. But I guess how does that dovetail if there was a loss of the Oregon City Station? want to see the, the contract to see specifically what it says. That contract may vary from what I'm going to tell you. But on the surface of a claim, if we had a loss, we do have that blanket. The buildings have been appraised by uh, CBiz, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, we do want to insure them accurately if it should be at 181000 What's the square footage there? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll drill down on that with Christina Day uh, after this meeting. If we had a loss, because it is a blanket, 
at that location, they'd pay up to $63 million. Okay. And CBiz has not uh, um, challenged those numbers, but I would love to get a copy and I probably have a copy of that contract, but I'll work with Kas uh, Katrina, Christina Day and get that and read through it. Christina, okay. forgive me for slaughtering your name a second ago. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're going to get to this. Um, there were just some terms in the coverages that I was unfamiliar with and was um, uh, curious about them. Um, one, it refers to uh, a social engineering fraud. What, what is that? We're talking about cyber liability right now? Yeah, um, and that's what it says on the schedule. We have a five hundred thousand dollars supplement for social engineering fraud. <laughs> it's on so, uh, page eleven or page thirteen, depending on which set of numbers you're looking at. I'm going to send you a. I'll send the board a, a short definition of what it is. Cyber liability, literally quarterly, is evolving uh, with uh, how we're being charged with claims, whether they want Bitcoins or cash, credit cards, whatever the case may be. Social engineering is one of the newer evolutions of where they're going. And I'll send you a short definition so that I don't misspeak uh, on what that is. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, and there's- and I apologize that- uh, uh, I, Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, there's a, another sublimit on equipment breakdown supplemental coverage that refers to um, expediting expenses, $10 million sublimit. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> that uh, equipment uh, is uh, our equipment uh, is our scheduled, what we call in the Marine uh, or mobile equipment. That's anything that would come off of the apparatus. Um, and some of the things are so back ordered, like some of the striker cots right now uh, are very expensive, but also somewhat back ordered. Sometimes we can expedite, we can get the, the equipment a little bit quicker, uh, uh -huh. but there's usually a cost with that. And that's why they put an inside limit on that. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. You bet. And I apologize. I want to hit social, because it is uh, newer, I want to hit it exactly on, and I don't want to mislead you uh, with a casual statement. Okay. I would like to talk just for a minute. Are there other questions? I would like to talk just for a minute about some short and some long-term strategies. We don't know when the market is going to turn around. We think that uh, it could be as soon as this next year. Most likely, it's going to be another year out before it completely stabilizes. And the market has the insurance market has a tendency to to go through waves. And over the last decade, it's been uh, very very competitive. Uh, the last couple of years, starting in in uh, 2018, insurance companies started posting some significant losses. And we started to see those rates stiffen uh, and increase. The things that we're really watching right now, uh, as you can see from your liability cost uh, and property cost, uh, driving is a big deal. Uh, you've got some great policies in place. You've got some great training in place, but we want to stay focused on driving. That's an area the insurance companies watch very, very closely. Um, we want to harden stations uh, with uh, the wildland fire. Insurance companies for the first time are looking at Oregon like they look at California. And your stations are already hardened, but we want to just be able to document that we don't have shrubbery close to the, the buildings, uh, our roofs, our siding is fire resistant, and so on and so forth. But you'll be getting a, a checklist from us on some things that we want to do to be able to validate that moving, uh, moving forward. And as Marilyn does uh, every time that we meet, uh, she asks uh, penetrating questions. Thank you for smiling. <laughs> Cyber liability, cybersecurity is our biggest concern uh, for the uncertainty. We have an insurance company that will give us quotes, but in the process, they will test your systems. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to buy anything different than you have from special districts, but they will come in and do some uh, testing on your systems. I'm going to recommend that we take advantage of that. It's a free process uh, and take a look and see where we're at with cyber liability. This field, cybersecurity, is changing, as I mentioned, quarterly. Uh, right now, uh, the Vogue cyber issue uh, has to do with PPP money, 
uh, and uh, care money that's coming from the federal government. It is insane, the claims that we're seeing. Um, Want to keep our strategic plan current. You have that, but that's a document that the insurance companies understand that you have uh, a good direction. You know where you're going and you're on point with that. And then just lastly, uh, we want to stay on point with our training with uh, uh, what's called employment liability with all of our staff, uh, but also with our board members. That will be the lecture that we do this year for you uh, that gets the extra 2% uh, in your best practices. You did get maximum best practices again this year. Thank you for your hard work, but also staff's. And you do get a longevity credit of about $13,371. That is a check that will come to you in February. So that's the, uh, the uh, short-term strategy. Long-term, what we want to do is, is continue to look to see when it is time to start looking at being more aggressive about self-insurance. Mm -hmm. I will be sending uh, you a, a definition. Uh, and John, what, yes. Uh, Christina posted in um, the chat, social engineering is a manipulation technique that exploits human error to gain private information, access, or valuables. In cybercrime, these human hacking scams tend to lure unsuspecting users into exposing data, spreading malware, malware. Uh, and infections are giving access to restricted systems. So, um, so yeah, if anybody wants to read what Christina posted, it's right there. I think it's pretty straightforward. But yeah, anything else you want to send to us, Jeff, great. But thank you, Christina, for putting that in chat. So, Christina, thank you so much. After I slaughtered your name, I'd like to know I've got a board meeting uh, tomorrow night. Would you like to be on that with me in case uh, we get asked that again? It was meant to be humorous. <laughs> Welcome to copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The definition was so long, uh, I did not want to butcher it and miss something. Well, people can read it themselves as well. So, all right. Anything else? Anybody have anything else for Joe? Okay, well, um, Christina, did you want to say anything else about this? Um, okay. I think I need to. The only thing I was going to mention was that the, the new insurance uh, cost is within what we actually budgeted for fiscal year 21. So that is very positive. So, um, um, all right, so we need to, I need a motion uh, to approve the property casualty insurance renewal with special districts insurance for the amount of $226,864. I so move. Okay, so Thomas, Mo Thomas moves, do I have a second? Uh, Director, Trotter, Director Trotter seconds that. Uh, Rachel, will you call the roll? Absolutely. Jim Searing? Uh, yes. Thomas Joseph? Yes. Don Trotter? Yes. Jay Cross? Yes. Marilyn Wall? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thank you for Christina uh, for that presentation. Um, so moving on, um, Chief Gerke, we're gonna talk about the IGA for medical direction with Clackamas County. Yes, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Before you is a staff report, a brief staff report requesting authorization from the board for the fire chief to sign and enter into an extension or an amendment of our current IGA with Clackamas County, and that would be for a year. So within the board report, you, you have um, this request, the current IGA, and then a letter from Philip Mason Joyner from the county. Um, he's the public health director, um, detailing what that would be and the offer that they've put forth. So um, yeah, so we're seeking approval from the board and I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Any questions for Chief Yerke about uh, the medical direction? Okay, hearing none, um, do I hear a motion to authorize the fire chief to sign an amended IGA for the EMS medical direction services between fire, the fire district and Clackamas County beginning January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021? 
Anybody? Anybody? So moved. Okay, Jim Searing moves. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Don, Tom. Don will second the, second that. So, uh, <laughs> Rachel, will you call the roll? Absolutely. Marilyn Wall? Yes. Jim Siri? Yes. Jay Cross? Yes. Don Trotter? Yes. Thomas Joseph? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, you guys. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, did you have anything else on that, Chief Yerke? No, I would just add that that last year, at the end of last year, um, uh, the county really stepped up and helped us out, covered us on medical direction for quite some time, and then at a discounted rate for six months, uh, a significantly discounted rate. And this is still less than we were paying in 2019. So um, that's all I'd add. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Um... We need to talk about amending the current IGA with uh, Estacada Fire District 69, Chief Charlton. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, in your packet, you have a um, request to amend the current 18-month intergovernmental agreement between Clackamas Fire District number one and Estacada Fire District number 69. Uh, this idea was brought to the Joint Oversight Committee on uh, December 16th and discussed. It was then moved to the Estacada Fire Board for discussion on Thursday, December 17th. Uh, they approved that unanimous, unanimously. Uh, what this does is, as you see in the staff report, there's six, uh, there six areas listed. Those are all assets, either a real property or apparatus that we uh, desire to transfer back to Estacada Fire as they begin to uh, stand up their own uh, fire services beginning July 1 of 2021. So we have a follow-up meeting tomorrow, and then they have a, a strategic planning retreat uh, next Monday, December 28th. And with your approval, we will work to begin to transfer these assets back so they can begin to uh, rebuild their uh, workforce and uh, start to access equipment. Happy to answer any questions. Hey, Brad? Yep. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Um, on uh, item two, the district shall return the possession honored before March 31st, 2021. Well, I thought at our meeting uh, that you mentioned January 1st, because they're already having meetings and they already are assembling kind of a committee. So wouldn't it be like January and not March? Uh, we did. So after discussion with Chief Dieters, we did recognize specifically to the apparatus, we want to make sure that our shops do a thorough PM. We transition mm -hmm. how the, the fueling through the um, a card lock fuel system is going to work. So we just wanted to build a little bit of time in to make sure that everything was going back. We've, we've checked all those boxes. Uh, not to say that we couldn't transition everything January 1st, but we wanted to provide a little bit of time to finish up the inventories and make sure that everything is high and tight as those assets go back. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Marilyn. Um, uh, so Fred, I just want to be clear um, that we do not need and will not need during the duration of our obligations to Estacada, which are not being changed, anything in any of those buildings or that apparatus. Because I don't want our people to have to go up to Eagle Creek to use the bathroom or that we use that for storage. We can't use it for storage. I understand we still have a main station in the George Station, but they need, in my opinion, to be completely um, self-contained. And we don't need anything else for any of these other assets of Estacada before we would return them. Uh, that is correct. So as we walk down that list, uh, the first is the training tower, which they have uh, connected with our training chief. And we do not have a need to access that training tower. We already have two tra training towers, one in Clackamas, one in Boring. Uh, the administration uh, building is uh, really sparsely used right now. It's just used to convene board meetings. We do have one employee who has had an office in that building. They are being moved out uh, by the end of the month, so we do not need that building. Uh, there is an auxiliary building, a little house behind the administration building right now that just uh, holds a number of the uh, equipment and uniform items that we're not using to service the contract, so we don't access that building already. Uh, we are proposing to return that 1998 International Pumper Tender and a 2008 Ford F-350 currently 
uh, our volunteer uh, force does not use does not use those assets. They use a brush unit, which is down at the Estacada main station, known as Brush 330. And then the community communications trailer is uh, an asset that we have not used, and it was uh, predominantly used by uh, the fire dis Estacada fire and the um, a CERT program for the use of ham radio operators. So yes, working with Chief Dieters, we feel confident that we do not need uh, those assets. Thank you. Great. Any other questions or comments or concerns about the uh, IGA? Okay. Good enough. Um, so do I hear a motion? Make sure everybody's got their got their speakers on here. Do I hear a motion to approve the amendment to the current IGA between Estacada Fire District 69 and Clackamas Fire District 1 for the uh, for fire pr protection and emergency medical services drafted by the um, by the legal counsel? Do I hear a motion? So move. Director Trotter moves. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. Director Searing seconds. Rachel, call the roll, please. Don Trotter? Yes. Thomas Joseph? Yes. Marilyn Wall? Yes. Jim Searing? Yes. Jay Cross? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, legislative updates. I know Jenna was not with us, but Chief Charlton, did you have anything in, uh, in that place? Uh, I do not. I know uh, last week, Genoa had sent out an email to the board just with her updates. I'm sure she'll provide us an update after today's uh, yeah. session down in um, down at the Capitol. And then certainly based on all the associations that we're involved in, we're watching legislative initiatives for the short session. So nothing okay. else. Okay. Um, for board committee um, and liaison reports, um, so I will tell you that uh, uh, Director uh, Thomas Joseph and I have been uh, busy working with Chief Charlton and, uh, and Brandon about the uh, uh, chief selection process. And there's been a lot going on on that, uh, as, as you probably know. So uh, Chief Charlton, you want to update the rest of the board on uh, where we're at on that and what the uh, next several weeks looks like? Sure, happy to. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, as you know, we have uh, six internal candidates who have applied for and begin to and are moving through the, the uh, steps for the uh, position of fire chief with Clackamas Fire. Those six candidates completed uh, phase number three, which was a presentation to the stakeholder group. That was on Monday, December 14th. Uh, today, the executive committee met, like Jay had noted, and we are working on notifying uh, the candidates who will be moving on to phase four, and phase four will be the interview with the board. Uh, that is tentatively scheduled between January 11th and January 25th. Uh, we know the 18th is a federal holiday. So Rachel, I believe, sent out a doodle poll to the board today to look at your availability. And then based on your availability, we'll block out the time, begin to uh, draft the questions and engage the board on how you'd like that uh, interview to go. So that will be phase four. We're right on track with uh, what we had presented a few months ago for the, for the phases and the transition. Okay, thank you for that, Chief. Um, any questions for um, for Director Joseph yeah. or myself for that? Yeah, uh, Tom's. I wanted to give the chance to the other three to ask us any questions about executive um, committee stuff. Okay, go ahead, uh, Thomas. What do you got? I just want to say, you know, I am really impressed how the programs are, are defined. Um, I'm, I'm very happy. The process is going very well, and I'm very happy with it. So, kudos to the chief and his team. Uh, this is going to be a very good pro, um, process that we will be all happy to be able to help us to select the right chief. Yeah, and I will. I would uh, concur with uh, Director Joseph's comments on that. Uh, it was a very good meeting today that we had with uh, with Chief Charlton and with uh, um, with Brandon. And so um, I'm I'm pleased in the progress of it too. I know that we can't get too 
too detailed into what we talked about um, because we don't want to uh, let too much out of what, what's been going on, but the directors will be, uh, be being notified by Chief Charlton here in the next couple of days to get to a little bit more details of what's going on with this, this process. So, um, uh, but yeah, it's been good. I, I'm, I'm actually uh, very pleased with, with the process and uh, the input that's been going on. So, okay. Um, yeah. Without any, anything, oh yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, Good, I was Jim. just gonna gonna compliment the committee. Uh, it seems like you're doing a good job. The packets, the, the note, notebooks that we received that had all of the resumes and information were really thorough and good. The email that Fred sent today that talked about the stakeholder feedback. So that sounds like it's gonna be really organized. And I know we're working on interview dates now. So. Uh, my compliments seems to be moving along very well. So good job, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. I just want to let rest of the board members know, I feel very, very compelled. The whole, the whole board has to be on board, the transparency and the, and the um, ability to do what we are doing. We are all in this together. Jay, Jay confirmed with me today that we are all going to be doing this together. So all the five board members will should be informed and will be informed of everything that is taking place. Also, um, I believe Chief Charlton, next board meeting, we're going to have an executive session too, specifically to talk about this uh, the this process as well. Is that correct? That is correct. So we're going to propose that we have um, the board interviews. And then after the regular board meeting on January 28th, we'll have a board executive session where the board can then have further discussion because it is a lot to go through the interviews. We want to give you some time to reflect on uh, the candidates and the great uh, things that they bring to being the next fire chief at Clackamas Fire. And then we'll talk about next steps uh, after or at that executive session. So, okay. All right, good enough. Moving on. Uh, Foundation, Director Trotter. Yes. Uh, at the November 24th meeting of the Foundation, uh, Operation Santa, as you know, is going on now. And the Foundation approved a budget of $14,000. But because of the changes and things, we also said it was authorized that we could add another $11,000 if needed. So that was a big step. Another one is that Blooming Bouquet, which is an all volunteer run organization dedicated to providing new clothing, shoes, bedding, and personal care items to underprivileged children and those entering the foster care system. And they assist boys and girls of all ages, infants through 18 years old. And the foundation granted them $3,500 to move forward with that, the things that they do. And then finally, regarding the wildfire fund, we have spent $100,612 already from the wildfire relief fund and includes funds that were given to the fire agencies impacted by the fires. Funds for these agencies were donated from Benchmade Knives with the specific intent that it go to fire agencies who were impacted. So the fire, has still have grant moving forward from it. Be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Any questions for Director Trotter on the uh, foundation? Okay. Uh, Joint, Oversight, Joint Oversight Committee, Director Trotter, Director Searing. You want me to go, Don, and you can fill yeah, in the blanks. Do you have a report at all for joint action? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, since our last director's meeting, our committee, Director Trotter, and myself, and our chiefs group, Chief Charlton, Dieters, and Brown, we've met several times amongst ourselves in order to try to come up with a list of items that we can present to Estacada's directors to help them uh, with the process of. Uh, become an autonomous, hopefully by June 30th of 2021. Some of the items that the chiefs 
put together for us. Uh, we're an analysis of Estacada's ending fund balance. We're trying to tell them, here's what you're gonna have on June 30th, approximately. Uh, Chief Dieter's uh, headed up uh, working on putting together a sample budget for fiscal 21 for them. A three, what a three person crew would look like, what a four person 24 seven crew would look like. Uh, and then they put together, I believe Christina put together some levy information uh, based on these sample budgets. If you don't have enough revenue and you want a three person full-time crew, well, you're gonna have to have a levy of blank to make that up. 20, I think they put together 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents. Uh, and then in the end, they worked with legal counsel to find out what the ORS law means in regards to the employees and the volunteer transfer. So they put all that together. Chiefs, you did a great job. I think that helped a lot. Uh, and then we had a full meeting last week on December 16th with their joint oversight meeting or committee. Had good discussions. Uh, our goal is basically to uh, try to work as hard as we can to help them return to full autonomy on June 30th of next year. They put together a continuity plan. I think most of us have probably seen that and uh, read it. It was sent out to us right after the election. We're encouraging them to follow it. If they follow it, it's obviously gonna require them to spend some money the continuity plan showed over 500,000 just between now and June 30th to get them there. But it's gonna have to be done because uh, whether it's then or later. So uh, during the meeting, they asked us to consider, would we consider an extension? And our reply really is more the goal, if, if we all work to set the goal of June 30th, 2021, then the, an extension probably doesn't need to be in the discussion right now. The goal should be June 30th, if it can be done. Director Trotter uh, said, well, it depends on why. And I think we all just really, uh, everyone, our firefighters want the contract to end on June 30th. We all know we got a letter that you probably all received. Uh, our staff, the chief's group, uh, wants us to try to make this happen June 30th. And I've even had some citizens reach out to me from some of the cities and in my neighborhood and ask, well, what happened with that election? And when I explained it to them, okay, well, great. The last thing we wanna do is impede SK to let them have it back on June 30th. So now I'm even, and maybe even some of you are getting feedback from citizens that are kind of saying the same thing. That's what they wanna do, then we wish them luck. So uh, I think we all agree it's in the best interest to move towards June 30th. So I think with all of that, maybe the chiefs can fill in about the, their board meeting they just had. And I believe I heard someone say that you have, they have another meeting on the 28th. So with all of that, hopefully they're uh, doing their work and we, you know, we'll, we'll work as hard as we can along with them to set that goal of June 30th. So that's, what I have to say based on my notes, Don, if you have anything to fill in and then maybe the chiefs can fill in on what you know that I didn't say. No, I think you covered it very well. I think the other thing that's important is that we will be continuing to meet with them in the joint oversight committee and we'll be discussing many issues that are going to come forward. And if necessary, we'll be bringing back recommendations to the board as to how we can take care of those recommendations and needs. Director Joseph. Jim and Don, budgeting process, all this, this is not our business to deal with it. We are completing the contract on June 30th. Shouldn't that be their responsibility, budgeting process, finding funding? Is that all, is that our concern? Well, I think when it comes to the budget, we, we would have been doing their budget for them anyway. So the issue is they, they have a lot of steps and a lot of items that they're gonna have to do very quickly, like hire a fire chief, like hire an administrative assistant that can help with their budgeting. 
like, you know, getting some of these things going. So right now, unless we assist them with some of these, it's not going to get done. And there's no way it could be done by June 30th. So I think it's my, my really question is, is that our concern or is it because the citizens have spoken? They want to be their own. So shouldn't that be their concern? It should be. It is. Yeah, it is. They, they need assistance because they don't have any staff, for example. Are they asking for help? Say again? Are they asking for our help? Well, giving, staff is giving them a lot of information that, based on questions they have asked. And so we, at the, as a committee, are just listening to them, talking with them, and discussing the various items. And as I mentioned earlier, if it requires action by our board, we'll bring it back to the board with a recommendation. Yeah, our, our chief's group, really, Thomas, is just uh, giving them some of these basic items, like I, like I mentioned, they need to know how much money they have. They need to know what a kind of a basic budget might look like. And uh, if they want to go for a levy, then what would it cost? So they're, they're just doing work for them to present them the information. So they'll have all of the tools to make their decision and to try to make that decision quick. I guess that's probably more than anything is they're helping them so that they can get over this hump and make some quick decisions because if they don't, then uh, trying to put this together and have everything in place by June 30th would be very, really difficult. And again, that continuity plan, I read it again the other day and it's actually well-written. If they follow that step-by-step step, starting after their December 28th meeting, they'll get there by June 30th. It's gonna cost you know half a mil more, maybe less, but it's gonna get them there. So. Uh, but we're, we're just really, our chiefs are just helping kickstart that process because right now they don't have anybody to do it. They can't do it themselves. The directors can't do it. So that's really what they're doing right now. And maybe Fred, you can fill in a little more on that. Sure, yeah, I think uh, two really important steps were taken last Thursday night at their board meeting. The first one is we asked them to approve a supplemental budget, which, in, which included $144,000 for personal services and materials and services this fiscal year. Those are funds that they have, but they hadn't been allocated yet to spend. So now they can begin to look to hire the staff and, and start to invest in the transition. The other step is we encourage them to have a board planning retreat. Maybe it's a strategic planning retreat or a standard of cover retreat. And they're gonna do that on Monday, December 28th. And we're really help, hoping to help them around getting some guidance on what they desire for staffing because the process to, to hire and train, whether you're a career or volunteer, we have about six months to do that. So as, as Jim said, we have to have somebody to transition the work back to. So we're working hard just to make sure that they can be a viable and thriving July 1 of, of 2021. So we'll let you know how their meeting on the 28th goes. Thank you. All right. Anything else for uh, joint, or joint oversight? Okay. Informational uh, board informational updates and comments. Um, this is an opportunity for the board to just comment on anything that they want to, to tell everybody else about. Anybody got anything? Okay, Chief Charlton, you wanted to talk about, you got a agenda here for, Jay. oh, Jay, I'm sorry. Hand up. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, Marilyn, sorry. Thank you. Um, I want to um, acknowledge the um, successes of um, Chief uh, Carlson, Chief Holland, Firefighter Lampman, and Program Specialist Tracy Grisham, who were all featured in the review on the men and women who are making a difference in their communities. And uh, a wonderful set of articles on all four of them. And I think it's, um, it's worth mentioning. Wonderful, thank you for that. Any other board members have any comments you wanna make? I'm gonna watch really careful so I don't miss any hands this time. Okay, Chief Charlton, did you wanna comment about uh, COVID at all? 
No, I don't think I have anything else to add other than um, I think Heather did a fantastic job. She presented last week to the SDK to Fire Board and tonight to you, and she really touched on a lot of that great work that's taking place right now to, to meet our objective, our number one objective, which is ensure the health and well-being of all of our personnel. So no, nothing else to add unless you have any questions. Okay. All righty, moving on. Informational items. Um, Chief Charlton, out of the Chief's office. Sure. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, just a number of thank yous tonight. I think you're going to hear some incredible work has taken place just really in the last couple of weeks around the fire district. You're going to hear from staff in a minute, but just to put it in perspective, uh, through November and leading into December, uh, we've worked hard to improve the performance related to the uh, Clackamas County Ambulance contract, and, and Chief Santos and Chief Yerke will talk about that tonight. Uh, completed Op Santa that you heard about, uh, completed the wildfire after action review on December 11th, uh, went through an accreditation site visit, which I'm sure Chief Stewart will talk about, uh, engaged uh, outstanding uh, staff in the fire chief process, trained and graduated firefighter recruits, continued the daily high performance of our firefighters responding to calls for service throughout the fire district, and continued to work um, the best we could within a pandemic. So really, as we look at closing out 2020, wow, it's been an incredible, incredible year, but I couldn't be more proud of our, of our staff, career firefighters, volunteers, elected officials, everyone who's helped uh, ensure that we provide the best service possible to the community. So I know you'll hear about all of these activities in a few minutes. I didn't want to take too much time. Okay, thank you for that, Chief. Okay, business services, Chief Whiteley. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, my report is as submitted with just a couple details to add in that are uh, kind of come to light uh, since the original submittal. Uh, I do just wanna echo and uh, to carefully not echo tons and tons of gratitude and thank you. I do really wanna thank staff for all their work on the accreditation stuff. Uh, it, it's, it was definitely unique uh, going through this and, and uh, um, it, everyone really stepped up and, and worked hard on this. And most specifically, I do want to uh, call out uh, Chief Stewart on this. He was kind of the glue that held this together. Uh, he remained agile, clear to the bitter end when we weren't even sure if we were going to get a, anybody on site. And he, he just did an exceptional job uh, carrying this forward and make, seeing it through to the end. And as you know, we received a, a recommendation for reaccreditation. So uh, just kudos to him and everybody else. Uh, just a couple other things uh, to point out. I believe you all received an email today. Uh, uh, just as a reminder, we have uh, three vacancies coming up on the Civil Service Commission. Uh, we'll be asking you guys to participate in a work session in January uh, as we navigate interviewing candidates for that. If you recall, two years ago, we did interviews and uh, felt that was effective and a good way to move forward to uh, make sure candidates were introduced to the board uh, before appointments were made. Uh, it'll be a little bit different, obviously, via Zoom, so I'll have more information out for you guys on that soon, and just a reminder that's coming up. And the intention is that work session is to have those interviews and allow uh, a few days at least before the board meeting to where we'd be asking you guys to take action on appointments. Uh, the only other piece is reminding we're kind of reaching that time of year where we uh, click redo on reviews and uh, the documents that we use, so we'll be working on a strategic business plan review an update for the goals and objectives uh, over the next month, and then also be uh, pushing out policies for everybody to review. If you recall, a couple of years ago, we made that commitment uh, to review and update those annually, and we've uh, stuck with that. And I think a heavy listing has been done the last couple of years. So we will do a full review, but I anticipate uh, that'll go uh, more smoothly than it has in the past. Not to say it's gone poorly, but it just, uh, I believe there'll probably less updates is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I believe uh, Trish Noble did have one thing to share. Um, so if she's available, I'll kick it over to her unless somebody has any questions for me. All right, thank you, everybody. Mr. President, members of the board, I just had a, actually a couple of things to update that came um, into play after the board report was submitted. And one thing I wanted to let you know is we as a district had to reach out to all uh, SDK employees who were formerly employed with Estacada and get a written commitment from them as to whether or not they plan to stay with District 1 or return to Estacada at the end of the IGA. Um, and as of last week, all nine employees have indicated they want to remain with District 1. So that is great news. We are thrilled to have them. 
Um, they're a good addition to our team here. And then on top of that, this past week, um, we made our way into the files and archives over at Estacada and wanted to make sure that those were cleaned up and ready to go in case any requests came from the board members for any specific information. Um, so also while I was there, we were able to set up. So basically any new chief or um, administrative staff coming in would be able to have kind of a start point for desk manuals for all the um, go-to questions and files that they need to have front loaded for when they begin their process of re-engaging as um, a fire district again, an autonomous fire district. So that will be available for them. And then the final thing is um, the um, EMS division, Amy Jo had been working on getting grants secured for a part-time temporary employee. And since she was able to do that uh, by January 1st, they have chosen who they would like to assist um, in the paramedicine. We reached out to that individual and made the offer. He has accepted it. So right now we're doing just background drug screenings. So that will be in place by the first week in January. And that's it for me, if anybody has any questions. Wonderful, good. Director Joseph. Uh, Trish, does all those nine firefighters from Estacada, they're going to stay with us. Are they, think... does that mean that Estacada will have to hire a brand new firefighters, are we helping them in training them? What, what's the process? Um, so basically that nine includes firefighters and then um, also administrative staff that came to us from Estacada. But Estacada will be starting from scratch in, in the process of um, new hires. And I'm hoping and assuming that's gonna start with them getting a fire chief on board, but there's more to come on that. And so in terms of what our capacity be, will be for moving them forward for new hires, that remains to be seen yet. That does fall to Estacada, but again, we want this process to be clean um, for them. So if they need assistance in some capacities, we'll, we will be available for that. I totally understand that, but would that cost us more money to find them a new employees or train them in any of that, is that costing us any money? So presently, because we haven't committed to that, the answer is no. If we actually engaged in doing like pieces, everything from background checks to psych exams to the actual academies, yes, that would have to be built to estimate it. There definitely are uh, some significant costs involved with bringing new staff on board. But they will pay for any expenses incurred to us that is my understanding, but Chief Charlton or uh, Chief Dieters could speak to that more. Uh, yes, they, they will. And uh, that's part of the uh, planning retreat we're going to have with them next Monday is really understanding what responsibilities they're going to take on, what responsibilities we're going to take on, and then determine a cost for, uh, for us to, to backfill to help facilitate that. At the end of the day, I want to make sure we are not putting out too much of our money subsidizing our taxpayers for Estacada, who is who is, doesn't want to be part of us. Yep. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, Trish, uh, Director Siri. Oh, the so the nine personnel, those aren't they? They must not have nine line positions then, right? Even though I thought that's how many they brought over. So the nine. Uh, previous Estacada personnel who now we're going to stay Clackamas, does that include the two administrative staff personnel too? Exactly. So they must, yeah. they must only have had seven firefighters then. Um, they seven actually, firefighting personnel. They originally actually had eight, but one is no longer with the district. Okay. Eight, 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 eight uh, line staff and then two administrative personnel. But now we're down to uh, nine total between the seven line staff and two admin folks. Okay, so that's good to hear. Uh, and I was going to ask Chief Dieters if I could about the volunteers. Do we are we obligated to do the same process with them, and what's their status? Do we know that yet? Uh, we technically we weren't obligated, but we did do that. We did reach out to them, and as uh, I've heard from everyone, and there will be uh, one chaplain and one support member that wish to return, so we'll be supporting them in that return the rest are uh, chosen to stay with the uh, Clackamas Fire District. 
Mm. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Steve, how many are total volunteers and how many are returning to Estacada? Mm. There are, uh, as of right now, there are five that are remaining from the uh, eight that came over. Uh, two have since retired as of the, or will be retired as of the first of the year. So uh, okay. I, their, their intentions were to retire. So it's okay. um, just one chaplain and one support water tender operator that are gonna uh, return to Estacada. And the others so are support. Off the five, two retired, and two are returning back to Estacada? Uh, of the original eight that came over. So what we'll have left is we'll have two suppression and one support, and then two will be returning, and okay. then two will retiring. Okay, thank you, Steve. And then, so since out of all career and all volunteer personnel, there's just two volunteers that are returning, you'll, we'll just have to work out when that would take effect, I guess as they're trying to rebuild, maybe they get fit in there sometime in between, or I yeah. guess, however. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our plan is to support that transition and what, whatever that looks like, either that's January or sooner uh, or later, but um, we'll support them in that, in that uh, process. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So that all, um, fell under business services for Trish. So financial services, Director Day, do you have anything for us tonight? Mr. President and members of the board, um, my report is as submitted, obviously from my staff report, it's been a very busy couple months, um, but we are uh, nearing completion on the audit. Um, I did wanna mention that originally came out on the draft agenda uh, for this board meeting to have the auditor come and do the presentation, but um, we're just not to the final point of that yet. Um, it will be finalized and submitted to the state on time, which is December 31st. Uh, and then we plan to have him come next month and do his presentation on that. So if uh, anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I do, Christina. Um, so if the audit is submitted then to the state before the board <coughs> approves it or sees it or whatever? Yes, it's the board doesn't technically approve the audit. They accept the audit. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if you didn't approve the audit, nothing, you know, there's no way for you to not approve the audit and you know, make any changes to it or anything, so. So, and what are the reasons why we don't have it done? Well, probably the biggest reason is that my accountant um, went on maternity leave for three months in August and just came back um, November. So uh, having her out, you know, during year end and um, audit preparation time really put a strain on us. Um, we did bring in a temporary person to do that to help with that and that really helped a lot um, but we also scheduled the audit the field work late uh, it was mid-november because we knew um, Anne was going to be out on leave during that time and wanted to give ourselves as much time as possible to um, get everything together for him for the auditor so okay. um, I did have one specific question on on the uh, financials um, the cafeteria plan claims cost um, is like $3 million over budget. And I wondered how that happened. So the claims costs um, object code is 6689. Right. Um, as uh, I think we talked about a little bit last month as well, it's a new object code this year, this fiscal year. Um, we're trying to separate out the claims from the premiums because we've been really getting some uh, larger claims hitting us the last year or so. So uh, I really, it's difficult to budget, you know, if you don't know, they just need to be separated out to make it more accurate when we do budget. Um, however, I didn't have the opportunity to move budget up into that line item. It was kind of a last minute thing uh, at the budget adoption 
um, last year. So I do need to, you'll see the line right below it, uh, 6690 cafe plan benefits is also low. It's not super low, but it, it's lower. So that does offset some of that amount. And that's where I'll be moving the budget from as well when I do that. So the budget will go down in 6690 and up in 6689 and that'll take away a lot of that. Yeah, um, we'll cover it though. <laughs> no, no. And the other thing is um, this year being the first year that we are trying to separate these out, we changed our accounting processes in order to be able to do that. Um, and since it happens only twice a month with payroll, it takes a couple months to you know figure out if it's the right way to be doing things. And after we talked about this last month at the meeting, um, we all went back in and looked at that again, uh, especially when Anne returned. Um, and I, we're all pretty certain that it's double posting some of the um, claims costs right now, the way we've got it set up. So, oh, sorry, bug flying into me here. <laughs> um, so we'll definitely be looking at that. Um, and I'm, we know what's going on with it. We just need to fix it now. We figured all of that out last Wednesday. So we'll definitely get that squared away for next month. Yeah, because you know the general fund is not exactly flush. And so uh, no. <laughs> a multi-million dollar hit is significant. So, okay. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. Thanks, okay, anything? Yeah, anything else for, uh, for Christina? All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, let's see, sports services. Did uh, Chief Carlson find a computer that worked? He, he did, unfortunately, he did have to step off just as the meeting was starting. He sends his apologies for that. Um, so I'm just stepping in for him here briefly. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have for that, or I believe uh, several of those directors are available as well if you had any uh, questions that were specific to those reports. Anybody questions or comments for uh, Chief Whiteley on uh, support services? No. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, community services. Chief Stewart, what do you have for us tonight? Uh, good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, the report is as submitted. I did want to take a moment and couple, highlight a couple pieces for you. As the fire chief mentioned, we went through accreditation, uh, well, over this last year, the different components of it, but we did uh, have a site visit that began the <clears throat> the first week of December, and it actually started as a virtual visit, which we had known about for a while. We had two individuals, one in California and one Department of Defense individual out of Oklahoma that we knew couldn't travel. So uh, they began their visit virtually. Uh, and then at the tail end of that week, uh, we found out that a third member of the team uh, with the spike in coronavirus cases down in California and the protective measures that are going on wouldn't be able to travel. So uh, Chief Charlton, Chief Whiteley, and I worked with CPSE, and they actually made an exemption to their standard practice. Uh, so they either do a hybrid visit uh, or did an all virtual visit, uh, the hybrid requiring two people on site, which we didn't have. Uh, with, with our input and the fact that we were mid-cycle, I believe, or mid-visit, as well as the fact that our team leader uh, has been a well-experienced uh, member of their their cadre for a while, we were able to go ahead and have him come out uh, as a lone individual uh, last week. And so he came out on Monday, uh, we greeted him, Had uh, he got a tour with Chief Carlson uh, Monday afternoon, and then uh, we, we had kind of an introductory dinner with him, which was then followed by three days of interviews. So between the two weeks and the four, uh, peer assessors. There were 27 interviews that covered all 10 categories. Uh, there's about 42 criterion, I believe, within those. Um, and so those were conducted. We had our out briefing on Thursday evening, which was a positive thing. Um, normally, that would have been done Friday morning on a regular schedule. But the uh, team leader felt that we were 
uh, well enough ahead and that he had a good handle on things that he was able to go ahead and get that uh, debrief done on Thursday evening. So we had uh, a number of our authors or department heads and other staff come and attend that with us. Uh, that's where they announced that we would be recommended for reaccreditation, and they shared a couple of the recommendations that they will have. Uh, we'll see more about those here shortly, but the next steps moving forward are the team leader is drafting his final report or his report. Uh, that will go to their technical reviewer. Um, that is expected to take a week or two weeks. Then it'll come back to us for error fact checking. Uh, then it'll go back to technical review and then get forwarded to the uh, commission for consideration. So depending on timeframes, we may have our hearing virtually, of course, in January, or it may be in February. So they've uh, adapted their cycle. They're not just doing the March and August hearings at this point, but they're doing them kind of on a rolling basis month by month. So I would expect by, uh, based on what he shared by February that we should be in front of the commission. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions on that before I go to the next couple points. Um, other than, I know Chief Charlton had said something today at our executive team meeting about possibly uh, at one of those uh, meetings having um, at least a couple of us, if not the entire board, us too. So I think that's kind of part of the plan too, so that we can support what you've got going on too uh, for that. I, I know that uh, we talked about doing a, a dual poll for all of us, or at least, I don't know, it wasn't dual poll for something else. But yeah, I think you're probably, we're probably going to, at least um, uh, Director Joseph and I will probably attend that as well. And I'm sure that the other um, directors will be invited as well to that. So, you know, that, that would, so we're looking forward to that, actually. That would be excellent to have you there. Appreciate the support. So, okay. Anything else for uh, Director Stewart on that? Yeah, go ahead, Director Stewart. Hey, uh, Brian. I know you're well versed in the process and in the system now. And in your opinion, them trying to do a reaccreditation during COVID with all these restrictions and not being able to go on site and, and dealing with it, are they really able to do justice for it? In your opinion, uh, did it take a lot away from it? And would they be better off just saying we're not going to reaccredit in 2020 or 2021 and maybe just kind of postpone? for a while, I was just curious what you thought. Well, that's, that's a great question. I think the I think the site visit itself worked adequately. The, the biggest challenge that they had was uh, not being physically present, of course, and each interviewer had their own way of accommodating that. I think it being a new process, um, ours weren't familiar with some of the adapt, adaptations that other agencies have done. Um, and I found out about this when, after our first week was, was already completed and we were looking at the challenges for the week ahead. Um, so some places have done video tours essentially of their, of their facilities, but it requires uh, a greater, I guess, depth of uh, conversation and articulation about what's going on. I attended about half of the interviews, um, maybe not quite that, uh, especially the second week. And I, I think it is limited. Uh, certainly, it's not as it's not as easily vetted. And I think again, the the biggest challenge was not being on site and not being able to connect with the fire department in in particular. Like the as you may recall, you know, doing the district tour and seeing kind of the layout of the land, where the high you know response areas are, what the community is like, all sets a tone for how we do our operations and how we conduct our business. Um, and that was a key piece that I think was missing. Um, they did a great job. It was certainly more burdensome on them um, to not be able to just to view uh, facilities, but to, to have to go and look at more documents and, and, and you know, validate based on different sets of paperwork rather than seeing with their eyes or hands. Um, so I think the, the other challenge that was faced uh, and certainly we weren't unique in this, is the lag between uh, March when we wrapped up writing our original documents till December. Uh, we had a number of individuals change, everyone from, from Karen Strait retiring and, and Rachel stepping in to Chief Corliss uh, and a, any other number of positions that caused some hiccups along the way, which 
for them and for us uh, just made it more challenging than it would have been in a normal year. But uh, validated and vetted, I, I definitely think it was. Okay, well, good job, and thank you for leading the, that process this year. So, good job. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, my question Thomas to Brian. Brian. Yeah, Brian, was yes, this a process they went through? Was it really meaningful uh, evaluation for the accreditation? Was it was it a meaningful evaluation process? Well, I, I think again, I think it was meaningful. Um, I think we accomplished the objective of them being able to verify and validate what we do, which is their, their objective. They want to verify and validate what we said we did and our internal work previously, and then make sure that they find us credible. I think they were able to accomplish that. Um, it certainly was more challenging and I would I would state that we probably had a little of a little bit of latitude provided uh, with the delay, with the the nine month delay and not all the documents being uh, written in November or even October as as would normally be experienced. So there was a lot of conversation um, and some documents that had to be um, researched and provided on site uh, or or virtually. I mean via email. Um, but it was definitely a, a, a worthwhile process for us to walk through. We ended up with uh, internally, uh, I don't remember the specific number, 180 something plan one for each performance indicator or core competency. And they will be providing recommendations. Um, and it sounds like they are, they have changed their, uh, their final report format. And so it sounds like they may be providing more recommendations than previously. Um, but certainly they also found highlights that they want to share. So for example, one uh, that was recently shared with me, and I believe it was shared back during the debrief, was uh, Director Bischoff uh, and his work in fleet and the way that he calculates the, uh, I think he, believe, I believe he calls it his fleet analysis, which basically lays out all the apparatus, how much time it takes for PM, how much it takes for you know X type of service. And it was something that this reviewer from uh, California hadn't seen, and, and I would expect to be highlighted in the report. See, those specific informations are very valuable. So I feel we can validate this accreditation process in this pandemic situation. Certainly, I, I would agree. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Yeah, anybody else? Any questions about the accreditation process? Okay, Chief Steward, do you have any, you have some more stuff you want to share uh, with just, us? I'll just uh, keep it brief. Two, two other highlights. Uh, one, I think staff, as, as has been mentioned, uh, has just been doing a fabulous job of keeping processes in place and making improvements in, in everything we do from, from telestaff to Interra uh, to how we conduct ins uh, inspections and uh, updates with, with uh, our telecommunication processes. So one thing that the fire marshal's office started doing last month is they started using um, a new virtual inspection uh, process. And if he adopted a standard, I don't have the number directly in front of me. Uh, so our, our inspectors now have the ability to, uh, again, do a virtual visit following a, a protocol where the business is able to walk them through and show them uh, particular aspects of the building or occupancy uh, and protective systems uh, and meet the intent of the code. So I think that's a, uh, a new process for us, and certainly as Sean Olson, our fire marshal, shared with me, uh, there's a lot of efficiency gained when you don't have to drive between facilities uh, and, and you're able to do this on, on appropriate ones. And then uh, I believe it's tomorrow, uh, ITS is doing a kind of a major cut over for us with our Office 365 implementation. This has been a, uh, a process that Oscar has laid out uh, in, a, in a project format to make sure that we're consistent in, in our approach uh, and that we have minimized interruptions. But tomorrow uh, we should have all of our email uh, and calendaring all swapped over from uh, our server-based pieces to Office 365. So uh, internally, uh, and for me, that's an exciting process. Uh, and with their preparation, I would expect that it goes off with uh, minimal. Uh, yeah. hey. Thank you. So I, 
I do have a question about that, Chief Stewart, which was seemed like it was just about a year ago or so. Um, they kind of forgot about the directors and we had some grief trying to figure out how to get to our email and stuff. And we kind of had to, I mean, I know I had to get kind of hand walked through how to sign back into uh, Outlook and all the rest of the stuff. So I'm just going to throw that out. Maybe, uh, I mean, as we do this stuff, don't forget about us. <laughs> so um, we're doing now probably. We nice to know about that before we can't get into our email or whatever. So, <laughs> no, certainly we want you to be able to, to have the tools that you need, just like all of our staff uh, and members. So, uh, I'll, I'll prompt Oscar with that. Don't not to forget you, you, you folks. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. Anybody have any questions for Chief Stewart? Any more questions for Chief Stewart? Okay, good enough. Anything else for uh, any other questions for the, the fire marshal's office or IT or uh, for the data for Shelby Hopkins for data stuff? Any comments about that stuff? Okay. Okay, great. Um, Emergency Services Division. Um, looks like Chief Yerke's up. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Yes. Can you can you hear me right now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's sounding uh, garbled on my end. I apologize. Uh, so I want to give a brief update on the uh, county ambulance service contract. I know we've been talking about this for a, a little while now, but Chief Santos and the EMS team has just worked uh, so hard on this. As soon as they got wind that there was going to be a change to the ambulance service contract. And I'd like to thank uh, President Cross for sending the information that he did send and it contributed to the process of us kind of walking through um, what this would look like. But we were notified in late October, specifically uh, October 27th, um, that they wanted to move to and implement uh, an evergreen contract in the county ambulance service contract. So the update is that on December 17th, uh, the Board of County Commissioners passed a resolution uh, to move uh, to this um, performance-based evergreen contract or in perpetuity um, for the ambulance service contract. The, um, the contract right now, or at least the, the resolution included in a year for um, the EMS Council and the, the strategic plan task force to get the work done necessary for them to implement this uh, this evergreen contract. And that was um, the crux of, of this when that news came out was just that that was very hasty, it was very quick. And I think the, the biggest part of this to point to is just how all the stakeholders gathered together, got engaged and collaborative and started working on um, making recommendations and having conversation with the Board of County Commissioners and, and all the employees and staff with the county. So that would include the fire chief, labor, EMS council, the strategic plan task force, ALS consortium, fire defense, and the leaderships with uh, the leadership within the county um, that ultimately through their adv advocating for our EMS system ended up with this one year plan. Um, although they're gonna move to an evergreen contract, we got time to work on the um, 11 areas of focus or strategic um, uh, focus that the EMS Council and the Strategic Plan Task Force were tasked with originally. Um, originally, they had until 2022 to get that work done with the ultimate goal of 2024 being um, um, the end goal. So this was really moved along quickly. We're thankful that we have the extra time and the extra year between now and um, the end of the year to get that work done and make better recommendations towards in improving that ambulance service contract. I wanna pause there just to, to see if anybody has questions specific to this. And I know Chief Santos is with us. He can fill in the blanks um, before I move on to the rest of the division report. Do you guys have any questions? Perfect. Well, if you do, let us know and we'll, we'll get the answers for them. The other thing I wanna highlight in EMS is when I took over from Chief, uh, uh, Chief Conway, 
one of his uh, pieces of advice was just don't get in their way. And if you look at what EMS is accomplishing right now, I, I would say um, it's not on account of me, but I I've tried not to get in their way and, and they're flourishing, they're doing great work. I wanna talk about uh, community paramedic Amy Jo Cook and the grants that we've received. So we we are the sub recipients of a grant through the county. Uh, the first one, Lines of Life, is a 19,500, which um, Trish had spoke to earlier, where we're going to be able to hire a, a part-time employee, uh, temporary uh, labor is what that's going to be, but uh, to do Project Hope work. And originally, they wanted to have those funds expended uh, by April. Well, we learned today that they're going to set up and allow for us to do that over the course of an entire year. So we'll have this person once a week uh, for a year to do that work. And Amy Jo really pushed uh, and, and advised them that that would be a better model rather than having a spike in a four month window and, and drag it out over a year because those contacts with um, people suffering from opioid addiction, it's better off to have a long uh, standing relationship with them and walk through these things over the course of a year. So. Mm -hmm. That was tremendous. We also um, received a grant from University of Baltimore in the amount of, I think in the staff report, it says 30,000. I think that can be up to 39,000. So uh, that's another uh, significant grant that we were the recipients of. And then Milwaukee PD just awarded us 5,000 for our community paramedic program. And then lastly, uh, Oregon Impact grant for 5,000 as well. And that one is for COVID um, quarantine of first responders and vulnerable citizens. So that's another, um, another grant that we got, thanks to the work that Amy Jo Cook has been doing. So very proud of her and, and what she's accomplished and looking forward to the next year to see what, what it looks like with her having an extra person helping her with that workload. A couple highlights out of wellness and training. Last month, I mentioned that Heather had to uh, pause the OCK Health stuff. They're planning to finish that up in January and, and fire that up again. And then I, I'd just like to point back to uh, all the work that Heather has done this last month, specifically the infection control plan, high risk exposure packet. Um, she also took the extra initiative to build a relationship with Legacy Health uh, to make sure that we had available testing for our employees because there was a, a window of time where testing was very scarce and Heather took the initiative just to make sure that we had an, a relationship with the right uh, location in case we had a member that couldn't get testing through our normal avenues. So I thought that was really good. Another thing to note out of Heather's report, we had 72 COVID exposure reports submitted and only six of those were high risk. And that just stuck out to me as just very significant. I think that's good. And that's because of all the work staff has been doing around the COVID book and the way we responded to this event. So again, though, thank you to uh, uh, Heather and her staff for all the work that they've been doing. And then training Chief Kenna and her team, they've been navigating the freeze and having to adjust how they deliver training. Uh, and their plan is to remove or uh, return to hands-on training next month and really ramp back up uh, as long as we're um, not in a freeze and, and able to do so with the right precautions in place. Last month, they were still really focused on the academy and uh, that concluded earlier this month. Uh, and I think the thing to note is with uh, the removal of uh, the ability to train like we normally do, Melanie's just done a great job of keeping staff busy on what she called in her report, uh, service improvement projects. And, and I say that because uh, the training department has just done a wonderful job of looking at what they're doing as a service to our staff and not just our line staff, but everyone, all of our staff from explorers all the way up through the organization. And so they've done a wonderful job. I'm proud of them. And they have quite the list of uh, service improvement projects that they engaged in last month. Um, that's, all, that's all I have. It was very little. Sorry it was so brief, but... Um, Thank you guys. Any questions, I'll try to answer them. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief Yerke. Okay, operations, Chief Brown. 
Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, I just uh, have a few things uh, to bring forward. Uh, my report is as submitted, just with a couple points to talk to. Uh, one um, is we had about 2,000 calls for service last month. And uh, for the year so far, Station 3 has uh, approaching 3,400 calls, and Station 1's uh, FMZ is, a, is approaching 3,000 calls, which is pretty impressive for both of those, uh, those areas of response. Um, we had uh, a couple uh, significant fires uh, in, in November, um, and I, I want to highlight a couple of them, which is a fire on Kazi Loop and the Portland Apartments in, in, in Oak Grove. Now, both of those are multi-unit apartment complexes, an eight-unit and a four-unit, and this really is speaking to our culture of life safety and extinguishment um, operationally. Uh, we, we kept these fires to the area of origin. Uh, and extinguish them, whereas uh, as every chief officer that's on here could reflect back to 10 to 15 years ago, and, and those fires would have been a second and third alarm fire potentially with, with four to eight units involved. Um, it just is showing the, the, uh, the training that is, that is being put into effect and, and the, uh, the, the smart but aggressive nature which we extinguish fires and, and take life safety. Um, and so super proud of our companies and, and what they're doing out there uh, uh, in, in their responses. Um, the, uh, the third thing I'd like to uh, speak to, and I'll just touch on it briefly, is the AAR. Uh, we'll talk more about that at next month's board meeting. Um, but I just want to do a quick shout out to Administrative Assistant Jessamyn Odie and Emergency Manager Greg Ramirez. Uh, the countless hours that they put into uh, making that AAR be uh, as successful as it was is commendable and uh, just super proud of them and, and their efforts and then proud of proud of our people for for really uh, uh, exposing their underbellies, so to speak, and, and looking at this process um, and as, as a mindset of, of where we can improve and, and celebrate what, where we had some wins, but also to celebrate where we can uh, improve. Uh, last but not least uh, is Chief Charlton. So um, Chief Charlton is, uh, this is his uh, last board meeting as an official before he officially retires. However, we'll be we'll have him gratefully for the last for the last six for six more months. But I just want to take a second to uh, thank him, thank him for uh, his years of service um, and and his dedication. Um, thank him for for his compassion and for cares about every single one of us. And um, I think sometimes that's a thankless position to be in as the fire chief. Um, and I just, uh, just wanted to, to give him a quick shout out and say thanks for, for all he does. And I want to wish uh, everyone from the board and all the uh, rest of the Clackamas Fire family uh, Merry Christmas and hope you guys have a happy holidays uh, spent around those you love most. And that's all I have. And be happy to answer any questions. And Nick. Yes, sir. It is never a thankless job. Fred has done an amazing job yeah. and we are all thankful, not only the board, but the whole district. So it is not a thankless job. It is thankful. He knows that and we, he knows how much we admire him, love him and support, uh, appreciate his, his, his caring. I agree, Director Thomas, thank you for saying that. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Chief Brown. Dieters, volunteer services. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. First off, Nick, how am I supposed to follow that? But uh, I will say you said it exactly as I wrote it for you. So great job. Thank you, Dieters. I, I really appreciate you, brother. Good looking out. You're very welcome. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, my report is as submitted. Uh, as you know, November was a little bit different with the freeze. And so training was almost all virtual. We did, they did do a lay-in blitz attack and then it was FR, FRP review. And then there was a virtual rehab drill. And then EMS was also virtual. Uh, and then uh, President Hamley is going to talk a little bit more in detail about Operation Santa and what it took to do this year. And that also starts in November as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the Explorers are still not uh, back on the campus yet. And um, 
There was no public relation uh, noted as well. Station coverage for station 12, it was uh, eight out of 30. And then uh, station 13 had 13 nights out of 30. Station 18 was 30 out of 30. And then the George Road up there at 333 was five out of 30. And the rehab group and water tender group uh, did 16 out of 30 nights. We did have some personnel changes. Uh, uh, EMT firefighter Rafal Tocheski resigned. He was hired and at an, or is finishing up paramedic school and has a contingent, contingent offer upon finishing that. So he has left the organization. And then we had a recruit, Nicole Thomas, that uh, has resigned. And then EMT firefighter John Strandberg had a, a struggle with a long-term injury and has decided that he's going to focus on getting that back together. Uh, and then Kirk will also talk about the association. And then the uh, Recruit Academy, uh, that is not what happened, what's written there. Because of the freeze, everything went to a virtual for the most part, but they're working to add those classes back in as restrictions change all the time. Uh, training is doing a phenomenal job of working with these restrictions and getting the training rescheduled and, and hoping to move forward, forward with that. Uh, and then before I turn it over to Kirk, uh, I just wanted to say a few thank yous, uh, not to the fire chief. I'm kidding. Yes, Fred, thank you. Thank you for your help with Ops Center this year. As always, it's, it's appreciated. Uh, and then Fleet Logistics, thanks again for uh, the building this year. And then also training for having the back part of the warehouse ready and then station 14 for helping with the toy warehouse. It's very much appreciative, appreciated. And then uh, Clackamas Emergency Services Foundation, we couldn't have uh, provided gift cards to all those families without your generous uh, approval of an additional 11,000. And we appreciate that. Uh, and so were the people that received them. Uh, so great, great time uh, handing those out. And then just uh, for um, for uh, fact factual for this year, we collected just just around 6,900 pounds of food, which is well different than the almost 70 that we usually collect. And then uh, 2,731 toys. And uh, last year, just for example, it was just about 9,600 were collected. Uh, we did serve 250 families, so. Uh, the tradition carried on and we were able to uh, do it one more one more time even even in COVID so I appreciate everybody's help especially the volunteers we had to keep uh, the groups very small to be compliant and uh, we did that and they, they worked really hard again this year and I, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who was able to help uh, happy to answer any questions. Steve yes sir uh, what the hell did you do to earn a stocking and Jim Searing's house. Uh, none of us have any. How did you, what did you do? Well, uh, you notice there's no name on it yet. So I, I do a lot of yard is, work. Your, your name is on it. A lot, a lot of yard work, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> your name was on it, I took it off. <laughs> you were bad. That's bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, I do want to make one comment uh, is, uh, you know, I know that we were way, we were way down on Operation Santa Claus uh, this year, but I will say that other, other, organ, other agencies, um, other police agencies and stuff really stepped up their game. So I still think there was a lot of donations that was given. It may have been just spread out a little bit where, I don't know, maybe Operation Santa didn't see as uh, much of a turnout because of, of what some of the other agencies in the, in the counties, in the count, both on all three counties were doing. So, um, you know, strong work on your part, but I think strong work on our citizens in general because they did give. Uh, they just maybe not gave as much as they had in the past to, uh, to uh, Clackamas Fire, but uh, I, and there was a lot of giving out there this year, I, I noticed, so. Yeah, absolutely, I would agree. Strong work on that. Um, I'm, okay, anything else for Chief Dieters? Uh, Mr. Syrian. Um, Good job again, Steve, on Santa, as always. I know we say it every year, but it's um, quite a project, as we know, and trying to adapt to COVID. Uh, good job, but I had a question on the station staffing for the volunteers. It sounds like with the three former Estacada suppression volunteers that are choosing to stay with us, with the academy that you have, and obviously having one less 
station to staff with suppression volunteers going forward, the numbers will probably be pretty high at our other stations, Clark's Eagle Creek and Logan. But do you know yet when we will stop staffing the George station? Or will you have to work that out with the committee or do we have a date yet? Uh, we're gonna work that out uh, with the committee. The, the challenge with removing them right away is that we would be making the conscious decision to have nothing up there and no, no response or no additional response. Even though it's limited now, it is more than what it was before. So we're gonna work, uh, the chief and I are gonna work with the committee on sort of a transition so they can be prepared for that, that moment when we won't be able to send people up there. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else for Chief Dieters? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna let uh, President Hamley have um, have the floor here for a second. But uh, something I did notice um, on the agenda tonight that uh, uh, Brandon Paxson didn't have a spot on there. So um, uh, Brandon, I'm after Chief or President Hamley's done. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to talk about your um, your report if you'd like. So uh, President Hamley, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members of the board. Um, Battalion Chief Dieters has asked me to speak highly of him about his uh, plans for uh, rolling out Operation Santa. Um, all, all joking aside, uh, he had months of, of planning and review and replanning on how to do this COVID friendly. Um, so a big thank you to, to you, Chief Dieters, um, for allowing this to uh, carry on. It's, it's huge in the community. It's huge in the volunteer program. Um, we do look forward to hopefully it going back to normal next year, um, but, but thank you. Um, essentially, the way we did it was we had a static um, display and had people drive through. That way we were socially distanced. We asked that they keep their donations in the uh, trunk. Oftentimes it was in the back seat and we did have to um, go get it, but they stayed in their vehicle. We were masked, gloved, all that good stuff. Uh, to get their donations. We kept a detailed personnel list on um, who was doing what each night. That way, if we did have um, any positive tests, we can easily go back and notify and quarantine and all that good stuff. Um, there are eight parades over three weekends, um, each night at a new location. Essentially, we had uh, Chaplain Kenton Johnson as Santa on Old Red um, as the, the cars drove through and made their donations. Um, we had rehab there, which uh, was all staffed by the new recruits, um, gave them an opportunity to get the rigs out um, and get all uh, the pop-up tents and the heaters and that kind of stuff um, off the rehabs and go there. Um, one of them, one of the groups um, actually responded to the Blue Heron Fire. So they got their first uh, event under their belt um, and, and got, to, got the experience to do that. Um, overall, is very successful. Um, like I said, we're, we're looking forward to hopefully returning to normal next year. Um, and again, a big thank you to BC Dieters, Peggy, and anybody else that played a role in making it happen this year. Is that good enough, uh, Battalion Chief Dieters? No, no, President Herb. He, yes, you sir. didn't actually, that's not what he told you. He, he told you a lot more, but he didn't say anything, everything he trained you. <laughs> Steve, what did he miss? No, I'll, I'll have to email him. It's like two pages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any comments from President Hamley on that presentation? Okay. Um, thank you for that. Okay. Uh, uh, Brandon, uh, do you have anything you want to add to your report? Good evening, directors. Um, there really isn't anything to uh, add to the report. It is as you see it in front of you. Um, I will say as a newly formed uh, department, that being public affairs, we're, we're focused on uh, to the best we can, having everybody work from home, kind of forming that cohesion and figuring out uh, and really establishing our direction and our vision over the next uh, handful of months. But uh, really, we are taking uh, that opportunity since we are so outwardly focused, uh, typically under non-COVID uh, restrictions and in, in interacting with our public. Right now, we're really focused on, on really uh, codifying all of our, our documents and lesson plans and really building that out, uh, speaking succession planning and, and making sure we have a good transition as some of our, our team members uh, move on in towards retirement over the next couple of years. So really using that time to, to set some vision uh, and work on that. And then I will just um, sort of reiterate what uh, Chief Brown said. Greg Ramirez, his focus was on the after action. He did a great job uh, 
you know, implementing that and being a part of that process as well as working with CERT, um, you know, continually working with CERT. And then public education, um, really using this time to focus on our wildland program, which we'll be rolling out uh, the, around the 1st of April. So uh, we're not out and about, but we're uh, definitely making good use of our time. But thank you for the opportunity. So Brandon, I understand that you have a new title uh, I've got a several, probably one that's more official and one we can talk about tonight. But uh, yeah, uh, in September was uh, promoted to Battalion Chief of Public Affairs. Um, and of course, that was a pretty busy time for all of us. And um, it was kind of right in the midst of, of everything that was going on with the wildfires. But uh, yeah, honored to be serving that uh, department and working with uh, the staff. I, 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 th I congratulate you for the new title you got. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. Appreciate that, Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have anything else for uh, for Brandon? Okay. Um, anybody have any com uh, comments on correspondence and informational items? I actually have one comment. Um, I um, this uh, there's some good stuff in here, but there is a, a letter from uh, Chief Craig Roberts, so or Chief uh, Sheriff Craig Roberts. So if you haven't had a, if you haven't looked at that, I would. Um, Maybe a good just uh, take an opportunity to read that that letter, that very nice letter from him that's in there. Um, any, anybody else got any comments about correspondence and uh, information items? No. Okay. Anybody have anything else that they want to talk about that we missed? These Zoom meetings sometimes we don't get everything out there that we wanted to. So yeah, go ahead, Marilyn. I think we should wish the chief a happy birthday. Oh yeah, there he is. Doesn't that. get any cake though. <laughs> virtual cake, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> virtual cake. Can, right. go can we sing? Diet. Can we sing, Marilyn? Let's I, sing. Oh. I think the favor, Thomas, would be that we not sing. Yeah, I would have to say that. I have to have <laughs> no, Rachel I, mute all of it. But I'm sure that you will call the chief on his real birthday and sing. <laughs> I'm sure I will. I will. I know you will. <laughs> Okay, well, the next board meeting will be uh, January 25th by remote conferencing. We will also have an executive session. Um, I also would ask the board members that as soon as those doodle portals come out, please, uh, there's going to be a lot going on in January uh, with, uh, so please be diligent with your emails and be watching for those uh, doodle polls that Rachel's going to be sending out to us and probably try to respond to those in a timely manner so that Rachel and Chief Charlton can get those meetings scheduled for us because I think it's going to be a busy month next month um, uh, with the uh, chief recruitment process and with the uh, uh, civil service stuff that we're going to be doing. So uh, we need to kind of uh, be on our A game uh, for the next, uh, for certainly through January. So uh, any uh, any comments about uh, about that? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Merry Christmas and Happy um, New Year. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, I, uh, I was just going to mention when you mentioned the January meeting. Hey, Rachel, the when you sent out that invite to everyone for the January and February meetings, they're on the wrong days. So when oh, we accept, yes. when we accepted them, they're uh -huh. on the third Monday. So it's not recurring. You probably have to resend those. So I just didn't want anybody to be confused. Thank you so much. That's a great catch. Yes, and I will definitely um, send something out for the the correction on those dates. Thank you. All right. Uh, it doesn't look like we have anybody else has anything else to say. So we will, um, I want to check my notes here real quick to make sure I missed anything. And it doesn't look like I have. So uh, we will call it at, at uh, 2013. Uh, the meeting of the regular board of directors uh, is adjourned. Everybody have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays.